This is the false part of the first if statement. Within this little mini if that's in the middle there, it also has a true part and a false part. If we look in the book, let me see what page it is. They do some nice little, they do some nice little reusability. They write a little function called device match that just makes their life a little easier. All right. You don't absolutely need to do that function to do this. That's just their attempt to, to, to simplify some things. All right, and make things easy. I kind of am annoyed that they did that because in my mind that, that clouds the issue. I mean, it's good programming practice to do that, but as far as like teaching someone how to do this, you know, that device match function really isn't needed here, you know. At any rate, if we look on page 196, they have a different set of if statements. And they come up with five classes instead of the three that I have. Their five classes are desktop, unsupported, which means probably all bets are off. It's probably some ancient kind of phone. All right, it's probably, you know, um, what is it, the phone that, you know, just has like one button that you press to call someone or something. I don't know. You know, those old flip phones, you know. How about a Star, how about a star tag? Right? Motorola Star tag. Oh, really? Is that? Is that? It's an old one. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it would probably be something like that. All right. They have a class for tablet. Then they have, so, so they handle unsupported things, all right, better than we did. Let, let's see where they got the extra five, uh, or the extra two. They have desktop and tablet like we do. They handle unsupported probably better than we did, all right. And then they split mobile into higher end mobile and lower end mobile. So I don't know if you have the book or not. Um, for those of you that don't have it with you, maybe we can quickly pass it around. Look on page 196 and you'll see it's this real similar code to what I have. It's just a bit more extensive. And their result, their end result, is to have class with five possible values. Desktop, unsupported, tablet, High mobile or low mobile, I think they call it. Now, I put this on, on top of every page. In my example, I only did it on the index page, but I should have did it on all the pages. All right. So what do we come out of out of this function? We come out of this function with a variable called class that has one of three values in our case, one of five values in the case of the textbook. We can then test that variable to customize our page either in terms of content or in terms of appearance. Now here's the interesting thing, just from a programming perspective. Let's go back to the index. I have a comment in here. Anywhere after here, I have a variable called class, which can be either mobile, tablet, or desktop. All my Werfel stuff is taken care of up here. So I don't have to muddy my program 
with a bunch of complicated Werfel expressions. All my Werfel work, boy, that's a, a tongue twister. All my Werfel work happens up here. All right. Now, could I do more Werfel work? Yes. Here I'm returning a variable called class that has one of these three values. I could return another value that was phone, which maybe is true or false. Another va uh, variable that had width in it, that had the maximum width of it. Another variable called operating system, so that I could customize for iPhone versus Android versus Windows versus Mac OS X. All right? So I could come out of this with more than just that one variable. I could come out with a list of variables based on whatever was relevant for the particular application I was doing. So my application, and again, I'm using the word application, I mean website, you know, and at some point a website is sort of an application, so I, I kind of use the terms um, interchangeably. Um, but if it was important to know on this page if it was a phone or not, then I would change that include file to, to also check the parameters to see if it's a phone and set a variable for that. So I could set as many variables as was relevant to the particular thing, and then I could use those variables here. Again, what I like about this from a programmer's perspective is clean. All right, let's say, you know, I'm working on a team of developers, and some of the developers are less experienced than others. All right, and we're all working on our own web pages. And, you know, I tell one of them, you know, we're going to do some stuff with Werfel. And they're like, what? You know, they don't have any idea about it or, or they don't know how to use it or, or whatever. They don't have to. I've modularized that. I can just say, hey, take this chunk of code, put it at the top of your page, and... You're going to have a variable called class that you can test to see if it's mobile, desktop, or tablet. Or if I expanded it, you're going to have a mobile, or you're going to have a, a, uh, a variable called is phone to see if it could be true or false. You're going to have a mobile, uh, or uh, why do I keep saying mobile? I want to say variable. You have a variable called operating system that will have the name of the operating system in. So I can really simplify it. I put all of that stuff up here in these include files, so I can just plop those on any page that I want to. All right, and just let just document it so that people know what variables you get out of this, and then people can use it without even really knowing like how Werfel works, or even that we used Werfel for this. All right, so now the rest of the way is very very similar to what we did before, except our if statements are a little more involved. All right. Here, I test if the class is desktop, that indicates an or, class equals tablet, then I give them one style sheet. Otherwise, I give them these style sheets in JavaScript, and we'll, we'll talk about those in a minute. So notice the construction of the if statement. If, again, all if statements look the same, there's the word if. The condition is in parentheses. You then have the curly brace, what you do if it's true, the end curly brace, then you have an else, or you can have an else with a curly brace, and then the ending curly brace. Notice here, we popped out of PHP land to get into HTML land to output the link tag. Just like with the else, we popped out of PHP land to have this little chunk of HTML. Notice that this is a compound condition. In other words, this condition is true if either of those two values is true. So if class is equal to desktop or class is equal to tablet, this will be true. When you have compound conditions like this, you enclose the entire condition in one group of parentheses, then each little mini condition you have uh, also enclosed in parentheses. So this is like a mini condition. This is a mini condition. And in this case, these are connected by an or, which means that if it's true, if one or the other is true. The other way you can do it is with an and. That wouldn't make sense in this case because no device is both a desktop and a tablet. 
all right? So you would do it with ampersands if you were doing an and under some, or, some other circumstances. That would be two ampersands, right? Two ampersands, right. And then what I have is, I might have gone a little crazy with the include files on this example, all right? But then I test different variables to see, or I test that class variable in different ways to see what content I want to display. So here, if I'm on a desktop or I'm on a tablet, I'm going to display that second paragraph of text. All right? So if that condition is true, I'm going to display the second paragraph of text. That's why there's only one paragraph of text on the mobile version. But there is two paragraphs of text on the desktop. Or maybe three, actually, paragraphs of text on the desktop and the tablet version. Likewise with the video. If it's desktop, I'm going to put the video right on the page. If it's not a desktop, I'm going to create a hyperlink for it. Again, for all the reasons that, that I said before. All right. Notice again, you're not really saving much code because you're either sending this or this. But again, video, watching video on mobile devices can get dicey, so we'll let the operating system on the device figure out how to play a YouTube video. There's no way to automatically um, like force a user to like switch to the to the YouTube application. I've got a site where I've clicked it and it's automatically like transferred me to another application just by clicking the link. Couple possibilities there. Um, the most likely possibility is that there's only one kind of application that you have installed that handles that kind of request. So, in other words, um, you know. One, think of last time when I had um, the phone link. When I clicked on it, it opened up my dialer. Why? Because my dialer is the only application on the phone that can dial that dials the phone. All right. Whereas in this case, because both the browser and the YouTube application can open it up, that's the more more likely thing. Um, under Android, I'm not aware of how you can force that. Um, you know. Android sort of is of the philosophy choice is good, right? On, on, on the iOS, I, I'm not sure at all if you could force the issue and have it open up in a particular application. Okay. That'd be nice if you could. <laughs> no, it's funny because I'm thinking the exact opposite. Oh, really? Yeah. What if the YouTube application is crap on some version of the Android? You know? Give the person a choice. Let them sort that out. All right. Now, typically, like with Android, if you're given a choice, it will you can choose between the things, and then you can select an option that says always do it this way. So, like, if I decided I always wanted to uh, open up uh, videos in the YouTube app, if I check that once, then the next time it wouldn't ask again. All right. So. Yeah, I'm kind of of, you know, let folks decide how they want to handle it, as opposed to, to control. Um, I, I've been, uh, and this whole discussion just reminds me, I, I finished a Steve Jobs book recently, and I've watched a couple documentaries on him and watched some clips on YouTube. The whole notion of, of op an open environment versus a closed environment is fascinating. Uh, because, again, you know, the whole idea of Android is that it's open, right? Just like Windows was, believe it or not, was open. Open to the degree that it could be licensed on a variety of different hardware. Whereas the Apple operating system could only be licensed on Apple uh, um, um, systems. And, um, you know, what's the better approach? You know, the, the, the Apple side says if we keep tight control over everything, we can guarantee a good experience. All right? Um, the open side, the Andro uh, Android and Windows side, says choice is good. All right, um, you want to you want to run applications that aren't in the Google App Store? Fine, we'll warn you about it. But whereas Apple, you have to hack your phone to run 
store uh, things not in um, the the, uh, the, uh, the app store or whatever. And again, it's, it's a fascinating topic, and it, it's funny how there's certain things, there's certain I won't say controversy so much, but certain issues that just pop up over time, like wearing different masks, if you will. Like the Android iOS is very much the Windows Apple uh, uh, discussion of the past. You know, it's like you could almost do a global substitute for it. It's like I always love Cleveland Brown jokes. You know, because Cleveland Brown jokes, you know, I remember hearing, like, uh, you know, Brian Sype jokes that five years later, the exact same joke comes out as a Bernie Kosar joke, and then five years later, it comes out as a whatever joke. So it's kind of funny, and it's almost like that with these, with these discussions. Notice how I didn't even say who their quarterback is now, because I have no clue who their quarterback is now. Uh, I don't think yeah, well, hey, he's two he's two and oh, his first two. Oh, all right. Well, hey, good for him. They switch. Yeah, the so quarterback one, now, who's a quarterback now, since they switched, they've won two games around. Oh, I thought each one won one. No. Oh, okay. okay. So, take a look at this and take a look at the example in the book. Again, don't let that matching function get in your way. That that matching function they they just put in to sort of make you know, make some reusable code, which code, which is a, a really great goal. But again, I think it kind of muddies the water. So that's why my example is a little simpler, um, and, and I think it really illustrates the things that I want to want to illustrate. All right, let's talk about logging onto the server. Why do we have server accounts? We have server accounts for a couple reasons. All right. First of all, this gives you a place to put your code. If you have not already installed PHP and are, are having, or have had problems with PHP or your computer breaks and you don't have a PHP server or whatever. So this is just, it's nice to have uh, space on a server to test your PHP code. But the other two aspects of it is that, um, number one, you don't have to worry about configuring Warful. You just have to take my Warful configuration file. In other words, we don't have a Warful assignment yet. You could use that for your next lab, but it's not a requirement. But when we do have a Warful assignment, you'll need to take this Warful configuration file and just pretty much copy it. Just use what, um, what I have. All right. So you don't have to worry about, even if you do have a web server running PHP, you don't have to worry about installing Warful <coughs> if you use this. The other thing is, because this is actually a site on the internet, you can then use mobile devices to test your stuff like, like I did with these and, and bring it up on an actual mobile device as opposed to the emulator. Now, emulators should never be like the last round of testing. You know, an emulator is, is a convenience thing, right? You know, so you don't have to worry about having you know, your mobile devices that you can test it. And you can get a pretty good idea, but, you know, final testing should be on, on actual devices. So about logging on to the server, all right? You want to be able to, all right, let's, just, let's, let's pretend this is our web server. Each of you are going to have your own directory to put stuff in. All right. You and you alone should be able to put stuff in that directory, at least as far as students go. You know, I, I could do it if, if I wanted, you know, if I was feeling generous and wanted to do an assignment for you, I suppose I could, but that's not likely to happen. All right. So you have your own directory here where you can put your PHP stuff. All right. Now the question is, is how do you get stuff into that directory? So you're working on your little machine here, your developer's machine. And let's even forget about Warful for a second. Let's, let's just think you're just doing a regular old PHP page, like you're doing one, you know, one, of, one of the PHP assignments. And you're developing your PHP code, and you're testing it here. All right. How do you put it up there to 
the actual web server. And this would be like if you finished a project and wanted to make it live, what would you do? Same idea. Right. You would use FTP. And FTP stands for File Transfer Protocol. Now you might ask, if I don't have Werfel installed here, how would I test Werfel? Well, we can talk about that, but essentially you fake it. Like, if I comment, like, when I was testing my code today on my server, I commented out those two include files, and I just hard-coded. Dollar sign class equals tablet. And the computer pretended it was a tablet. Dollar sign class equals mobile, and it pretended it was mobile. So these are all little tricks that you can do, because I encourage you, as always, to not try to do everything all at once. You know, get a small piece of it working and going on to the next piece. And if, for example, you were working on a Werfel project and you weren't ready to do, to do the real Werfel code, fake it until you're in a position to do it. Then you can go and you can test it and do all those nice things. All right, FTP, File Transfer Protocol. How can you FTP over? Well, there are FTP clients available that you have. And in fact, if I'm not mistaken, if you're using Windows, Windows Explorer has just built into the Windows Explorer has an FTP client. So I hope and I think this guy has FileZilla on it, which is a common FTP client. I think the machine has it on there because that's what yeah. I use. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna show you how to connect a couple different ways. All right. And um. And and then you can you can do which way you want. For this, for, the, for your server space, your user ID will be your first initial followed by your last name. So in my case, M. Zellers. Your password will start out being your student number. But I believe I have it con with no leading zeros or anything. But I believe I have it configured to ask you the first time you log on to set a new password. So you can try that out today. I'm hoping that there'll be at least some time at the end of class for, for everyone to try it out. So user ID, first initial, last name, password, student number, you'll be prompted to change it. Your directory on the FTP server will look like this. CISSQL dot Lorraine CCC dot edu slash CISS 268 slash fall 2013 slash that part's the same for everyone. All right. And then it'll be your user ID again. So your user ID and directory name are the same thing. So your first initial and last name. So if I were a student in this class, my directory would be called M. Zellers. That should be the only directory that you can put files in. All right? Should be the only directory you can put files in. When you log on via FTP, if you find yourself in another directory, you probably need to get to this directory because otherwise it's not going to let you. It's going to bounce you if you try to do that. All right, so let's look at connecting to this, and let's do it two ways. Now, as they say, your mileage may vary. <laughs> it, 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 let's put it this way. It's not may vary. It's going to vary, right, because I have different permissions on the server than, than you do. So um, it's going to look a little different for me than it would for you. But let's go the two different ways. And the first way is, okay, we do have files that look good. First way is just using standard Windows Explorer, which there we go. So if I go in here and type in FTP C I S S Q L. dot Lorraine CCC dot edu. You should type in the rest of your directory path. I'm going to leave it like this. All right. It'll prompt you for your username and password. All right. From there, it's 
just like you're using regular old Windows Explorer, right? So what you would do is you would navigate to your folder, which, again, CISS 268, Fall 2013, your folder, and then you could just drag stuff up in there, all right? So you could go and drag files up in there and just copy them. And that process will just FTP it up to the server. How do you test it then? Well, you go open up a browser. In fact, let's do this. I'll delete it. But let's go and let's copy these things into Amanda's folder. All right, there it FTP'd it. How would I test it? I would go to open up the browser and go to CISSQL dot learn. Looks like I got mad in the middle of it and started yelling. <laughs> Now, if you just put in the directory name, you'll get a list of that. You'll get a list of the files in it. And then you can just click on the index, and away you go. All right. So to delete it, just... In essence, once you connect to your FTP site through Windows Explorer, it's just like you're moving files around Windows. It's just that that, that, that directory isn't on your machine and it's just out on the internet and you're accessing it via FTP protocol. So you could use that if you like. In a way I don't like using that because I can sometimes forget that I'm on an FTP site because it just looks like another folder. So I generally prefer to use like an FTP client. And there's a bunch of them for free, you know. It's like kittens, you know, never pay for a kitten because you can always find one for free, right? Never pay for an FTP client because you can always find one for free, all right? And FileZilla client is for free. And the idea is the same. I need to connect to the particular host. So the host will be the site that you want to connect to. So CISSQL.Lorraine ccc.edu slash and then you'd fill in the rest of it for, for you. You have your user ID and your password. And then I can go and remember the password for this. And it went and it connected to it. Then to transfer stuff, and this is more standard for FTP, I go and like find my folder over here. So let's say it's something on the desktop. Where'd the desktop go? Or, well, here, we'll go to CINETPUB WW root. And then I'll go to the folder that I want to go to. Then I can go highlight the files I want to send over, right mouse, and say upload. And that will upload them there. I can do the opposite if I want to. So, for example, if I want to see the version of the code that was running on a server, I could right mouse and say download it. You can and drag it, and drop too. And you can drag and drop, yeah. So. This is the way I prefer to do it, and this is, you know, FileZilla is cross-platform, so like if you're running Mac or whatever. Now, the good news is, is once you do it this way, then, you know, it keeps a list of the, the, the servers that you have hit, and, and uh, then the next time, you know, if you remember the password, then you don't have to type in that, that massive string. I don't even think you need to. If, if, if you're using it on your own computer, you see that little, the little button to the right of Quick Connect? If you click on yes. that, it should list all of 